Hello there, Vector Podcast Season 3. In this season, I made one simple promise. I will try to stick to 30-minute episodes. Let's see how well I will do. It's it's not always easy, especially when you have guests like Eric Pugh that I'm really having a pleasure to talk to today. I can say that we've been working together on Cupid, on ideation, on, on things. And I've learned a yeah. ton from you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm super excited. So when did I come visit you? Was that... I think I think it was two years ago or something. Two years ago? I Wait, think so. so. Yeah, it was post-pandemic, I guess. Yeah, it was the very end of the pandemic. Right. Yeah. I remember getting my... Yeah, so... It was right. still pandemic. It was still pandemic. Yeah, still pandemic, right? Because I had yeah. to get COVID testing. Yeah, so... I was, yeah, I was like, I want to meet Dimitri in person. And I called you and said, I'm going to come to Helsinki and visit you. And I think you were like, why? I mean, we don't work together per se. We worked on Cupid though, quite a few evenings together, right? I think it was like nine o'clock your time, Helsinki time. Yes, and sort of yes. Two it was a, and it was Friday. I remember a, vividly yeah, exactly. Friday. <laughs> What so else I to do? Want to show some. I went camping with my family. Can I screen share, Dimitri? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, you have to give me permissions. I went camping with my family, and if you think back to my visit to you, you, you and your wife gave me a, a little, a, a little gift. Yeah, can I give me screen sharing. I can only do you host. Let's do a host, and you can screen Excellent. screen share. Excellent. All right. And so I just wanted to share off this, this cup uh, on the, it, there it is. So we've had that little wooden cup. I think it's a traditional Finnish drinking vessel when yep. you're out in nature. And there it is with coffee. And then I'm also showing off my metal ceramic, metal enameled cup that I picked up at OpenSearchCon EU a couple of weeks ago in Berlin that Zeta Alpha shared, had some great conversations about search relevancy and measurement with them. So we took these two cups on our family camping trip the yeah. other week. So I wanted to show those off to you. Dimitri. This is lovely. This is lovely. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're, you know, putting this in good news. Yep. Yep. It goes with us. So fantastic. Yes. Yes. Where we start. First of all, hello. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you very it's much for having me. It's long overdue. And usually we start with a little bit of a background. Obviously, people can go. I think you even have a Wikipedia page about you. I think so. I don't know. That I is a so. light goal, right? That I is a light it. goal to get to a Wikipedia page. <laughs> I don't yeah. know that I'm quite there yet. Yeah. So <laughs> my name's Eric Pugh. Been doing search for about, I don't know, we're like getting 15 years. And I, I, I was there for when search was like first, ooh, you have your own search engine. And it was very exotic and there was nothing open source. It was all commercial. And then cut my teeth in search going through the big data time period, right? When, yeah. as Grant Ingersoll said once, search is the UI to big data. And it yeah. was all about how data can we handle and how do we store it and scale up our search engines and that was great and kind of led into the machine learning time period where really at that point it was like, okay, we have lots of data. We can now search it. What does it mean? What are, what are, what are people looking for? Right. It wasn't enough to have fast search with 10 blue links. It was all of a sudden became really important to be like, am I giving my users what they want or not? And machine learning and data science really kind of came along and helped us make those determinations, right? So really, and that's when Open Source Connections, the company I was one of the co-founders of, and I'm one of the leaders of, really kind of focus in on the value side of search, relevancy. Am I giving people what they're looking for, right? How do I drive more revenue in e-commerce? How do I help people use my SaaS product so they subscribe and renew their subscriptions? All of those, right? And yeah, machine learning was awesome. Data science was awesome. Really, you know, got into a whole measurement thing. And that was kind of the, one of the, the products that I steward, Cupid, we know each other, came out of that time period because we said, why are we building custom tooling for every project? Maybe we could share some things. So, and then, yeah, today it's really been exciting to see sort of 
generative AI come along and vectors. And it's interesting because I still feel, you know, for a little while I was like, is search still going to be a domain? And, you know, search has totally changed, but it's still how people interact with systems, right? Whether it's a bot and a retrieval augmented generation or a more traditional keyword search, using LLMs, using models, using vectors, still a search engine in the middle of it, mediating, moderating that conversation. So really excited about what Gen AI is letting us do. And I think my big takeaway right now is that historically search was fairly mediocre. You could make it a little better. You could make it a little worse, but it was always like people understood. It was fairly explainable. Mm -hmm. Why I'm really excited about measurement and understanding these days is because now with Gen AI, we have much better tools. We don't have to have mediocre search, kind of better, kind of worse. Instead, we can have amazing, accurate search search results that really understand what you're looking for. And you're like, yes, this is exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. But flip side of it is sometimes those search results are batshit crazy yeah. and you have no idea why it came back with it and yeah. you maybe lose yeah. trust. And so now, yeah. instead of all search results sort of being in the middle, sort of, yeah, a little better, a little worse, we're now really polarized. Sometimes they're amazing. Sometimes they're terrible. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand what that curve looks like and make sure that the amount of terrible is something that we're willing to deal with, right? Terrible results, one in 10,000, one in 5,000, yeah. one in a million. Depending on your domain, it may need to be one in a billion is yeah. a terrible, right? Depending on what you're doing. So exciting times, really exactly. exciting times. Yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. And of course, I'm very pleased to also being able to pick up Cupid with you early on, where I tried to pioneer it in two companies ago. And it was I was leaving actually, <laughs> but it was yep. almost ready. And then the next company, I actually deployed it. And we, I remember we generated 70 Jira tickets just by looking at queries in Cupid, because you know how it usually goes. People develop software, other people yep. check on it, other people are just project managing and things like this. And no one really takes the lead on looking at the queries. And this is actually the most fun sometimes to look at queries and sort of, you know, investigate what's going on. Do you even like these results? How do you feel about them? You know, let alone setting yeah. up a team around it where some annotators can actually go and label with some domain expertise, you know, or maybe pretending to be users and things like this. So it's an amazing system and we continue to use it today. Of course, this was the first thing I pioneered at TomTom Tom and it's still there. That's you know. fantastic. That is wonderful. I mean, it, it's been great to see sort of the adoption of the product and then people are using been using it for a long time. So I'm going to show a query set today that is a thousand queries and maybe a thousand queries that have been judged 10 deep, right, by hand for three years, almost four years. This one organization, Veterinary Information Network, has been using Cupid for years. And now they've built up this massive body of ratings and they have tons of data and trend lines for what did search look like four years ago? What did it look like last year? What does it look like today? It's really been exciting to see them. And they've just been using the little hosted Cupid, app.cupid.com, and but it's worked for them. So a thousand queries. Definitely takes a long time to work your way through. But, you know, these days, they're just kind of keeping an eye on what's changing, right? Barring a major algorithm change, it's just sort of staying on top of it and keeping everything right. But yeah, yeah so it's really exciting to see, see people using it. Yeah. Uh, definitely, I'm having, yeah, a little bit of thoughts about where does Cupid live in our generative AI future? I've uh, been playing a lot with tools like Ragus and some of the other ones, right? And it's interesting to see what tooling and where does Cupid do things well? Where does it have challenges? Where do we want to go with it? So, yeah, for sure. And for those who don't know Cupid, I mean, I can give my short intro, but yeah, obviously please, feel free to augment. But like the way I see it is that it's basically instead of hearsay, 
and sort of someone saying, Yo, your search doesn't work. And here is one anecdotal example. What you can do is that, or, or vice versa, you could say, I improved search. And here is one an anecdotal example where it really shines, right? Now, now what? Should we ship it? So, yeah. you know, so basically, I think Cupid really gives you the tooling and you can actually, even if you want, you can even do it in an unbiased, as unbiased way as possible, where you will do blind labeling in some sense, right? So you, I, I've mm -hmm. done it actually just recently. And, and basically you, you allow your users, well, your domain experts actually, but maybe even developers to go label queries. And it also has this sandbox where you can actually, mm -hmm. well, you can plug in your own engine, but you can also plug in those standard engines like Elasticsearch, Solar, you know, OpenSearch yeah. and others. And I think you even added some vector search engines recently, right? Yeah. So, so we have Vectara, which is a pure vector search engine. Yeah. We've got Algolia. And then open search, Elasticsearch, Solar, the Lucene-based search engines. And then kind of exciting, you can also now plug in your own search API. And so you can just talk to any API, a RESTful, Git, Post, JSON sort of API you can use with Cupid as well. So yeah. that's been really good. Fantastic. Um, I, I love this. Why Cupid? This is sort of the origin story. Doug Turnbull, who many of you may know, right from his book relevant search he he created cupid and we're looking at like a decade ago at this point and it was because you know it was difficult to measure and improve search right lots of spreadsheets going back lots of conversations you fix one thing break another and doug and rena were working together on a project and it was literally this is the origin story for cupid so cupid's all about making collaboration better making your testing more accurate and making things go faster, right? Because we need to iterate and experiment quickly, right? The yeah. one thing I know is that the team that can experiment quickly and effectively is the team that's going to win out, right? It's not about specific technology choices or technical yeah. expertise. It's experimentation. Can you do it quickly? So, yeah. So Cupid.com has sort of the advertising free hosted version um, really excited that it's sort of continues to be useful in today's world. Absolutely. And it's also open source, right? So you don't have to be buying anything, whatever. It used to be a product though. It used to be generating revenue. Yeah, I remember I you mean, told me. Yeah. We're a consulting. So yeah, we used to sell it. We used to sell it for $10,000 a year for an enterprise <laughs> license yeah. and we had customers and it was great. But I think then we figured out we were making... I don't know, $80,000 a year, which sounds like a lot, but then investing $150,000 in salary supporting it. And it was like, uh, mm, yeah. Yeah, we're exactly. not a product company <laughs> and we are open source, open source connections. Having a commercial product just didn't fit naturally. And since we're all about training our clients and empowering search teams, right? Doesn't necessarily feel empowering to be like, yes, we've empowered you, but you have to pay us money every month for this one product, mm -hmm. right? Just felt more natural to have it as an open source project. Yeah, absolutely. And it also fits your, well, how should I say it? Your professional line, yeah. right? You are a committer. Lucene, solar committer, right? Yeah. So I am a committer, not active on Lucene. That's just a level of technical expertise, but I am a committer on solar and then interesting as like an interesting personal professional development. I've been really gotten much more involved with the open search community over the whole year. And so I'm now a, they call it a maintainer instead of committer, but I am a maintainer for open search documentation, which mm -hmm. has really been wow. really a lot of fun to work on. And we're talking about it maybe in another podcast, but contributing some new features to open search the open source product. So yep. really excited about that. So actually give, give me, give me one second. I have one thing to confess. One second. I have to confess, confess or, or share one personal bit that when I started in search, it was 
course, it was earlier. It was like 2003 about when I wrote my own search engine. But when I started doing search in the industry, right, it was 2010. And it was Apache Solar. And yeah. when you Google Apache Solar, you would mostly find Java, Java Doc. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and maybe, and then I figured out there is also a mailing list. It was like, but is there a place where I can read about solar besides wiki pages? Because wiki pages were not kind of complete in a way. Yep, yep, yep. I was like, and I found this this book. Oh my gosh! With right, your name on it. One point four yeah. enterprise server. David yeah. Smiley and myself. Yes, yes, and I and I've read it cover to cover. I have to that say it so... because. Because yes. I had one challenging task. I had to build or to suggest and that or to suggest had to abide to certain rules. And I was like, oh my God, how will I do it? And the moment I did it, it was also slow. So I had to figure out on our data, on our version of a model yeah. of data, right? Oh my God, this was so exciting. I was like going back and forth between the book and then a bit of Googling oh and God. then trying things. Ah, yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow. Thanks That's for awesome. doing this. So no, you're also the you. author. You're also so. the author. Yeah. 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 So we did that book. We did, we did a, a second version of it for updated solar, but that was quite a few years ago. Um, I am kind of curious what's going to happen with technical books, right? I mean, mm -hmm. in the solar community, we got the ref guide, which is, I think, pretty darn good considering how it's written. I do sort of wonder what the future of technical books will be with open source communities and what what yeah. do we do with them so yeah. maybe like cookbooks you know like that you, that you have specific use cases and like how would you come about building these things and maybe real data so people can actually try things right yeah so. yeah yeah i mean it has gotten a lot easier to publish on the web right yeah. and you know, yeah. most projects have something uh but yeah. yeah what you know i think a lot of people write a book sort of as a rite of passage as well Right. So mm -hmm. it's a paper book, little different than writing a book for an open source project yeah. reference. Right. For sure. Yeah. How to make them printable. So you can say, I wrote the book for this open source project, but we'll yeah. see. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Exciting. But you also wanted to show something. Let's demo. Yeah, I, I, I'd love better. to. Yeah. So we touched briefly on Cupid, right? And I'm one of the stewards of the project. And historically, for those of, here, I'll just go ahead. For those of you who've used Cupid in the past, the way it has worked is I'll just I'll just bring up my local host. Here we go. Right. So one of the things that we've added in the not in the in recent this is the development version. So user with realistic activity in Cupid is who I've pulled up, and I got a couple of cases here. But you know, in Cupid, it works well. I'm going to bring up a case, right? Here's a case. I'm going to search for milk. I did a query for milk. This is using sort of a random data set here. It's backed by a solar search engine. You can see right there, there's my search engine. And Cupid works great for a relatively small number of queries, up to 100. Right. And one of the things that we found is that the, this interface works well, especially if a search engine is super fast and responsive. But because this is a rich single page JavaScript application that's making queries in real time to a search engine, if you have a thousand queries like the people I mentioned before, takes like 15, 20 minutes for this UI to load up and all the queries to be run. And we know that lots of people want to run more queries, 5,000, right? When people ask, how many queries should I be measuring? I'm like, well, start out with what you can. If that's 25 and 50, that's better than zero. Think about 200, maybe 300, maybe 1,000, 5,000, right? And then above 5,000, that's sort of only for the most sophisticated teams. But Cupid kind of tops out at, maybe a thousand queries. And so we've been doing a lot of work to think about how do we support larger data sets, right? Larger query sets. 
Um, and what's been really fun is to work on introducing background processing, right? Instead of everything being limited by the request response cycle of your web browser, what if we could run some background jobs? And so I'm just going to show really quick. I'm going to go and bring up all the books. And I've got an import feature. So we have exported a book, book export 39. It's a 62 megabyte JSON file. So 62 megabytes. And I'm going to go ahead and click upload. And now in Cupid, what we're starting to do is we can take large files, JSON files predominantly, and we store them in the background and we kick off a process, a background job. And there you can see right there, we are loading a whole bunch of queries, right? And these are all sort of scientific queries, some, some very complex ones and some simpler ones. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's going to take a while because this had, what, 28,000 query doc pairs, right? So that are being loaded along with their judgments. So, but what's sort of fun with the new background jobs and using WebSockets, we're also able to push up updates to you as background jobs are happening inside Cupid. So right here, there we are, and we are loading a whole bunch of data. Wow. Now, yes, it would be nice if it was a Parquet file, not a MySQL database that we were using. So we'll have to think about some of those things, mm -hmm. but this is starting to open up the door to moving larger data sets and being really comfortable with that sort of 5,000 queries, 50,000 query doc pairs kind of mm -hmm. data. Not going to manage the 100,000 queries or quarter million documents, those data sets, yeah. JSON is not the right format, but we're at least scaling it up to get a broader set. The other thing that I'm also excited about is we're getting closer to being able to run these analytics on a regular basis, right? Now that we have some background processing, we could think about every night we rerun all thousand uh, documents um, and every night we could be storing them. So these little charts here that you see that are sort of showing some basic scoring information, Mm -hmm. You could start using this to monitor it over time instead of having to roll your own dashboarding tools. Yeah. So, so that's something I'm really excited about. I'm also going to point out to two PR. So GitHub.com 019 S Cupid is the open source project. And a couple of pull requests that are in progress, but looking to land them soon. Right here is this pull request 976. Imagine if we could run thousands of queries nightly in Cupid. Now that we've got background jobs working and communicating with the user, right, of state, this will be coming pretty soon, pretty soon in open source time, which means, I don't know, we'll see next few yeah. months. Depends yeah. on if I get people helping and testing. So this mm -hmm. one's super exciting. Let's go back and see how we're doing. Yep, there we're wow. doing. Uh, so there we go. We're up to 4,968 query doc pairs as we kind of count down. So yeah, this is all through the magic of WebSockets, which has been really cool to see. And as you are loading this here, are you also executing it against the search engine? Or are you... Here, because we had all static data. Yeah, right. static data. Yeah, uh, yeah. A book represents the query doc pairs with all of the data, whereas the case yeah. is where we do the real-time querying. And and now that we have this one working, once we have this PR mm -hmm. complete, then you'll be able to run a background job in Cupid with a similar counter, maybe up here next to one of your cases that says we're running queries. 5,000 queries, and this is our progress towards yeah, getting yeah. it to, and the number, the error out. Yeah, yeah. So, but of course, so, for, for, for listeners to understand, like what takes time is basically, of course, also inserting this data into Cupid's databases, like MySQL, right? 
and Redis, yep. I guess, or have you stopped using Redis? I'm not sure. So we're actually, so we're using MySQL as our database. However, what manages this communication web sockets is all in Redis. So uh -huh. as the back, and it's how our background jobs and our front end jobs and our web browsers keep track of each other is yeah. through Redis. Yeah, so, interaction. Yeah. So if I actually, so if you, you know, I'm running localhost, so you won't see it, but if everybody who is connected, who has permissions for this book, everybody would be seeing these messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of broadcasting so, to everyone yeah. who has access. Exactly. exactly. So that's something I'm really, really excited about. The other thing that I'm really excited in Cupid is LLM-based judgments, right? So you kind of started out this conversation about using Cupid with human judges, annotators, right? Mm -hmm. And gathering high quality data. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, human judges is expensive. Not every organization can do it. Um, my colleague, Scott Stoltz, last year did some interesting work playing around with ChatGPT when it first came out to evaluate, is this query and this document relevant, right? To yeah. judge. Yeah. Um, and then we've been working with Moody's on their AG solution and using what we've been calling Judge Judy, an LLM, to evaluate. And what that lets us do is we're basically using a small set of human judges to validate our LLM judge, Judge Judy. And if we have good correlation, right, our iterator reliability looks good, you yeah. know, flights, Kappa, Cohen's, all those metrics look good, then this gives us confidence to go ahead and scale up the judgments, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, using an LLM. So today, that is a bunch of pandas, notebooks, and kind of custom code. However, the other pull request that I'm really excited about, right, is this Meet Judge Judy. She is your AI-powered subject matter expert, right? Yeah. And so in the not-too-distant future, you will be able to, let me go ahead and bring up this case, right? Here we have one person who's been the judge. Yeah. But soon you'll have a second column next to it, Judge Judy, yeah. right? Who using whatever prompt you've typed in, right? Or provided is judging. So that's the other big, how do we scale up Cupid and make it relevant in our Gen AI world? Right. Those are sort of the, the two big things. So this is fantastic. This is really so, fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I hope these PRs will land really soon, especially the OLM one, right? Because this allows people to really quickly hit the ground uh, running and start labeling. Uh, actually, someone will label in a way. But exactly. Exactly. The trick is having the right props, right? Yes. And having the right set of positive examples and negative examples, right? But one of the things that I were working on, so Cupid, right, ships with a set of data science notebooks. They need a little bit more work. Let's see if this comes up. Oh, in my dev version, I don't ship that. So I'm going to switch to the production Cupid. Yeah, no worries. And notebooks. Oop. There they loading up. So in this examples folder, we're actually shipping a couple of notebooks for you to use. Fleiss Kappa, Jacquard, and RBO comparison, multi-rater analysis, right? These notebooks here, you can directly use with your Cupid book of judgments to evaluate how we're doing overall. And so this can let you take your human judgments, understand how good or bad they are. And then when you bring the LLM power judge in, compare the LLM judge to what your human judges were doing and feel some confidence. So I'm really excited to be shipping these because I think it's going to lower the barrier to getting judgments. And that's something that a lot of search teams are like, I would love to use Cupid. I would love to do this, but I can't 
do any of this until I have judgments and I don't know where to get them or I don't have the domain experts that I need, right? Yeah. And, right. you know, search-oriented organizations often have that figured out. But a lot of other teams are like, we just need a search engine that works what you know reasonably well and we don't have that. So we got to lower the barrier to getting judgments in judgments and and i'm excited about this this is from so. that fantastic direction but i can i can also add from my personal experience you know that yes you're absolutely right that there is this sometimes there is even a friction right so a search engineer says no i don't want to label i'm a search engineer i'm developing the algorithm but they will get so many more insights so much more insights if they actually label and yeah. in our teams you know if you have i don't know 10 people and if each will label 10 queries, then you will have 100 queries labeled. So, of course, if you don't go for overlapping and stuff like that, but if you go, then, yeah, it's another story. But, you know, and then all of us, all of a sudden get all these insights, right? And now, now the LLM thing can actually help you scale this, right? And then, of course, all this prompting and... In Label Studio, by the way, they have released a, maybe it's something to think about, a, a capability where an agent will learn from user feedback, right? So let's say they label and then, so LLM will label, make make some mistakes, and then the, the main expert will correct them. And, and so it takes it in as a feedback and then it yep. becomes better over time. So it's basically... You can kind of support it. It's like you're not copilot. Someone said, <laughs> Sid Propstein in the previous uh, episode yeah. said confidant. So you kind of like give these things, you collaborate in a way, right? So yep. that and would be, yeah. this is fantastic yeah. direction. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is definitely very much around that more narrow relevance judging versus generic labeling way Label Studio is, right? Um, yeah. But I think there's definitely room for inspiration from both Label Studio. I've been looking at more as well as Ragus and how it's doing some of the new metrics. Yeah, you know, is interesting. So, yeah, exactly. But what I love about Cupid is that I can really connect it to the live search engine. I mean, not necessarily in production; it can be some development version of it, and I can yep. start labeling and querying. And as you said. Search is the interface to big data, right? So Cupid becomes interface to your search, which is the interface to your big data and all the unknowns there. That one is terrible. That one looks okay. Yeah. Link data, that one looks okay. That one looks terrible, right? We can immediately start building. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that one's okay. That one doesn't look it right. We can immediately start building some sort of understanding, right? And that's just a quick little binary one, right? And we can start building that and get a, get a sense of what our score is going to be. So, exactly, exactly. And yeah. that score is also customizable. So we've done some little implementations in like JavaScript looking like language, right? Oh, I think it's JavaScript, right? It is actually JavaScript. Yeah. You just come in here and you take your score, right? And there is, so here's classic NDCG at 10, but you can change it. So like yeah. the one recently, we wanted to know in this score right here, we're being you know, penalized because soy is returning zero results. And so it's giving us a zero. So it's bringing down our average precision. But what if you wanted to know that it was supposed to be zero results? Zero results is actually the right thing, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So in that one, we actually went in and said, we added an option, a per query option should be ZSR. Right. And we set that option. And then in our custom score, if it said should be ZSR was true and there were zero results, then we gave it a one. Right. Yeah, because awesome. it's actually working the way. And vice versa, we had other situations where, yeah, if we started returning results for soy, that would have been worse search. Right. And so, yeah, that, that was a great use of a custom score. Yeah, fantastic. Wrong about that because it was a great use. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. Also, where Cupid helped us is sometimes you don't speak that language. So it could yeah. be Korean language that you don't speak, but you exactly. need to improve. And in one, on one occasion, we've sent a Cupid to yeah. 
our Korean native speakers in the company and they've labeled and they told us how it looks. So yep. <laughs> that worked. So uh, the other thing, right? So here we are, we are happily loading up all these, but I'll go ahead and click judge, right? So this is sort of an older approach to rating, a zero, a one to 10, wouldn't do that now, but that's what we've been saying. So there you can see, here is the human rater interface. Now, I don't know what is a good rating or not, but here we can go, we can rate some documents, kind of taking this from, this is a recent add-on, which is if you're, if you can't rate it, why, right? Mm -hmm. I am a vet in there. I am not a vet and don't understand the science yeah. in this query. Yeah. Right. And so I'll skip judging that. And, and that, and that, that's been, that's been helpful in just cranking out your human judgments. So, yeah. So here we go. Got just a couple of judgments, mostly Jeff, uh, yeah, Jeff's got 2,500. I've got four in here, and I marked one as unrateable. Now, I can reset that, which should throw it back in the pool, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we have a conversation about why it was unrateable, and then throw it back in the pool. So, wow. hey, we're almost there. We are almost <laughs> there, right? That's the background it. job is wonderful, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's any faster, right? No, so, no, I so know. So at least watch it and watch the countdown. So fantastic demo. Can you tell a bit more about the tech side of things? We did mention SQL, MySQL, Redis, uh, yeah, JavaScript. So, so if someone wants to jump in and start, you know, coding and and sort of what what is the level of effort they need yeah, to go so through? Honestly, right? it's a little bit of a challenge, right? So most of us. So this is a Ruby on Rails web app, right? Like it is a full stack web app and this is all just standard Ruby on Rails. The app has been upgraded over the years to be with the latest standard. And so if you do Rails development, everything's going to feel very comfortable. Obviously, a lot of us in the search or information retrieval world don't have that expertise. And that, that's just a challenge. So one thing I will say is that if you join or ask questions on relevant Slack, pound Cupid, happy to answer those questions. The core application that you play with in here is an old Angular 1 app. Works great, no problems, but it's an Angular 1 app. And because it's an open source project, not a commercial product, we've sort of stayed away from attempting the big rewrite to mm -hmm. update it to React or name your thing. Lots of examples. It seems to work fine and evolves. Um, so Cupid, Angular 1 app for all of this. And then outside of this, this is all just standard Rails application, lots of model view controller type screens that you can see right here, all standard Rails, MySQL database, Redis for sort of the communication layer. And it's all built using Docker. So if you want to, so the README has way too much developer-centric setup, right? But if you have Docker, then you run bin setup Docker. Yeah. That will set you up with the development environment. Literally what I was just showing is yeah. bin setup Docker. Uh, and then you fire it up locally with bin Docker server, and that runs it locally. So... There's a lot of docs in here for all the different parts. It can be a little overwhelming. I think we have to rework some of this documentation, but it's all there. No, uh, a couple of things I'll show off. We actually have an API now. So right here, you have a you come here and you generate your personal access token mm -hmm. like that. And just for fun, if I and and this curl command will show you your user. So we have authentication API, and we're slowly working on documenting all of those AP, API, API, PIE, API Pi. What am I doing wrong? So, ah, there we go. 
API PIE slash, we're slowly documenting all of the APIs. And so one of the things that I encourage people, right, is maybe Cupid doesn't do everything you need to do. And so you're building some scripts outside of it or in some notebooks, but you can use Cupid as your shared source of truth. So maybe you have a case that represents your golden set of queries, right? You in your notebook can go and grab all the queries. So, and so we're adding sort of more and more documentation on all of these different APIs. So yeah, that's um, fantastic. Yeah. So make it a little bit easier for people to understand. So I can look at this, here's case four, but I can also look at it like this. As a JSON, right? Mm -hmm. This should give me back my JSON, right? Yeah. It's all my JSON data, right? There's all my different scores, et cetera. So if Cupid provides some value, but doesn't do everything you need to do, you can read and write from it. There's a lot of export and import functions as well for it. So yeah, so, that's yeah. fantastic. And uh, yeah. Loaded. So, it's loaded. Oh, <laughs> that looks the... like, there we go. 29,287 wow. query document pairs and 29,291 judgments. Right? Wow. So, yeah. So there is. Well preserved. So. There you go. This is so. fantastic. Thanks for the demo, Eric. I've learned because <laughs> I wasn't keeping up as closely. I think we're also running an outdated version of Cupid. So I will ask the team to to upgrade, obviously. because. Because we, yeah. we, we should. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the, the release cadence is fairly fast. So make sure your deployment model is pretty simplistic and automated so that you can just keep up. Yeah, so. exactly. This is fantastic. I'm sure we can talk more about your other projects and we will uh, save it for another oh, episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I was also thinking, I, I like to ask this question and now I get the chance. Yay! The, the question of why I call it, or the, the motivational, what keeps you up at, at night, so to say, uh, why you are still in search, Eric, you've spent so many years. Do you think it's still unsolved or what, what keeps you going in, in this topic? Yeah. So what I love about search is it, it, it kind of reinvents itself every seven years, five to seven years, it sort of reinvents itself every seven years, right? I sort of started out with saying at one time it was exciting just to have an open source search engine, right? In a world of big, expensive commercial search engines. And then it was really exciting to get into big data from the search perspective and then becoming a data scientist, right? I mean, I, I'm a, I, I pretend to be a data scientist. I pretend to be a machine learning guy, right? through search, right? So it reinvented itself. And now I'm a prompt engineer and generative AI person through search. And so I love that the field reinvents itself, yep. but also certain long standing principles around measurement and experimentation appear to remain relevant, even though it reinvents itself every seven years, right? Yeah. And has been really, really exciting. Like, I like that what I'm doing now is not what I was doing seven years ago. And I suspect I won't be doing it in another seven years. Uh -huh. And that I like making things happen. I like solving problems and search remains sort of the way people interact with technology systems, right? I am really intrigued or looking forward to when search isn't just, I ask a question, get a response, but I ask a question, I get a response. Then I have another conversation and the search engine understands that. And we actually have, we, we talk about search as a conversation, but we don't normally do that. We just pretend it's a one shot kind of thing. I look forward to that side of things. And then what are the new use cases we're going to enable, right? I'm going with my family to Spain for three weeks in July. Got my plane tickets booked. I got not great flights, but cheap flights. Imagine that there was a search engine out there that knew what my plane flights were, knew what my wife's personal tolerances are. And if it was constantly shopping for a cheaper flight 
and actually oh, yeah. canceled the current flight and Gabe bought the new one. And, you know, just let me know, by the way, I saved you another 400 bucks for your family of four, or I found a better flight or there was an upgrade, right? Mm -hmm. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if once you kind of gave it the parameters is doing that? And I suspect that's going to kind of look like a search experience, right? It's going to be a query with a bunch of parameters yeah. um, that understands what my preferences and tolerances and risks are. Right. And that's going to be a really interesting thing to measure. And I think it'll be really powerful. So, so wow. I'm excited about that future. I suspect that's the next thing that we get to once we get through kind of the current generative AI stuff. Yeah, that's a beautiful answer. Thanks so much. Really. I've learned a lot today. I'm sure we will repeat this. Let's do it. I know you have another topic to talk about from uh, your conference talk. Yeah and uh, another project you're working on. And I'm sure Cupid, Cupid continues to be really relevant to what we do. It's, it's, a, it's a toolbox, right? It's, it's a tool in your toolbox, or maybe it's a toolbox of, <laughs> full of yeah. tools. But I think it's a fantastic one to have to really complete your search journey. Because if you are only writing code and you're never looking at queries, you're never labeling, you never hear what, you know, how, how does it feel like, you know, using this search engine, you will not get far. So please use it. I mean, of course you can set up something, you know, in the kitchen with Excel, but Microsoft Excel, whatever, or Google spreadsheets, but maybe that's not scalable enough and not repeatable. And yeah, why waste time if there are already cool tools like keep it open source. Yep. I'm really excited yeah, about this. Right. So uh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. The scaling up is super great, super exciting. So yeah, it will be interesting to make sure that Cupid remains true to what it does and doesn't try to become all things to all people. We'll see what happens. Absolutely. So. Yes. And you, you as a listener have a chance to contribute. It's open source. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So. Thanks so much, Eric. I really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers.